In this video, we're going to go through some examples of using the fundamental counting principle with some probability. Um, you might want to watch part one if you haven't done this before. It really sets it up nicely with tree diagrams and uh, easier examples of using the fundamental counting principle. All right, so here's our next example here. Sam, Tom, and Jim run a 100-meter dash. List all the possible outcomes of the race. For example, STJ means Sam finished first, Tom finished second, and J finished third. So you could use a tree diagram for this again. Oops, I don't want to do that. Here we go. Let's try that. You could use a tree diagram. Um, but let's try to do this this time without a tree diagram. So let's say Sam finishes first. So that would mean uh, Tom could finish second and Jim third. Or Sam could finish first, and I guess the other possibility would be Jim then Tom, right? So Tom could finish first, and then Sam and Jim, or Tom, and then we could switch these. Then the other possibility for first place would be Jim, and that would leave uh, Sam and Tom, and then we could switch those, Tom and Sam. So I tried to do this in a orderly way by first picking who was going to finish first, and then all the possibilities for that. So B says, use the fundamental counting principle to find the number of possible outcomes for the race. So here we see six possible outcomes, and we've actually listed them, which is kind of nice, because for a probability problem, that could come in handy. If I'm using the fundamental counting principle, I'm just looking at all my possibilities here, and I'm saying, okay, so they start the race. How many possibilities are there for finishing first? Well, I've got three. Three guys could finish first. One of them finishes first. Let's say it's Tom. He's done. Now I've got two guys left to finish second. Let's say it's Jim. Jim's finished. Now for third place, I've only got one possibility. If I multiply these together, I get six possibilities. So the fundamental counting principle tells us there's six possible outcomes for the race. Listing them actually gives me those six possible outcomes. All right, let's continue with this expand it a little bit. I've got Abby, Brad, Connie, and Dan running a 100 meter dash. List all the possible outcomes for just first and second. Okay, that's all we care about is first and second. For example, one outcome is A, B, which would mean Abby and then Brad. Well, let's stick with Abby finishing first. Okay, so if Abby finishes first, then I guess Connie could be second or Dan could be second. All right, so that's pretty much it for Abby finishing first. So now let's go to Brad finishing first. Then it could be Abby second. It could be Brad and then Connie. Notice I skipped Brad and Brad because that's not a possibility. Brad and Dan. All right, that's it for Brad. Now let's go to Connie. So it could go Connie, Abby, Connie, Brad, not Connie, Connie, right? Connie, Dan. And then it could go Dan, Abby, Dan, Brad, Dan, Connie, looks like 12. There's 12 possibilities for first and second. This is different than the last example. The last example, we did the whole race. We didn't do that with this, just first and second. Now, using the fundamental counting principle, first place, second place, well, I've got Abby, Brad, Connie, Dan. How many possibilities for first? Four. Right, four people. Now let's say somebody finishes. Well, then that only leaves me three possibilities for second. Four times three is 12. So there's my 12 possible outcomes for first and second. All right, let's expand this more. Abby, Brad, Connie, Dan, Eddie, Fran, George, and Hannah run a 100 meter dash. Don't panic. I'm not gonna ask you to list all the outcomes. That would be a lot, wouldn't it? Use the fundamental counting principle to find the number of possible outcomes for first, second, and third. All right, just first, second, and third. First, second, and third. So one possible outcome would be A, B, C, right? We could start listing them, but let's see how many we would actually have to list. How many participants do we have here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people running the race. So for first place, there's eight possible people that could finish first. 
So let's say Brad finishes first. I don't know. It doesn't matter, right? Well, whoever finishes first can't finish second. So that's going to leave seven people competing for second. Once that second place person crosses the finish line, there's going to be six people competing for third. Fundamental counting principle tells us we'd multiply these together. Let's see, 8 times 7 times 6 is 336. So if I would have asked you to list all the possible outcomes like we did here for first and second, only 12. If I would have asked you to list them, you'd have to list 336 different possibilities. So sometimes you can solve a problem by listing all the possible outcomes. But it gets really big really fast, so using this counting principle really helps you be able to calculate the number of possibilities quickly. Part B, use the fundamental counting principle to find the number of possible outcomes for the entire race. So one possible outcome would be finishing in alphabetical order, or maybe Hannah finishes first, and, and Georgia finishes second, and Brad finishes third. Like, how many possible outcomes would there be? Now we're doing the whole race, right? Eight, seven. Uh, I'm giving you the answer. First, second, third place, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth place. So for first place, we have eight people who could finish first. Hopefully you can see what's going to happen here, right? We're going to have this pattern again, but now once my third place finisher finishes... We have five people competing for fourth place. And then we have four people completing for competing for fifth place. This is kind of hard to write because I'm going up and down. Seventh place, eighth place. All right, three people, two people, and then it's always kind of that last person. We got to cheer them on here. There's usually one person out there. So eight times seven times six all the way down. Um, we're going to multiply all these together. There's actually a shortcut for this. This is called 8 factorial, and it's written like that. I'm not sure if this calculator has a... F oh, it does have a factorial button. Awesome. Let me show you the long way first. 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2. And it shouldn't have to times by 1, but we'll do it anyway. Uh, 40,320. Now watch this. See this button right here? 8 factorial 40,320 that's what this exclamation point it doesn't mean 8 it means 8 times 7 times 6 all the way down to 1 so this what it was it 40 shoot i forgot already 40,320 so if we had um you know only uh, let's go back here let's go back here real quick we had 3 people running the race 3 times 2 times 1 um, this is 3 factorial. 3 times 2 times 1 is 3 factorial. 3 factorial is 6. Okay, So that factorial can be a nice shortcut for working through these problems. All right, I have two more examples for you. Use a factorial to show the number of ways 7 different books can be arranged on a shelf. Evaluate the factorial with a calculator. This is the exact same problem as people in a race. All right, here we were arranging eight people in a race, first, second, third, all the way to eighth. Here we're arranging seven books. So we could say that these books are book A, book B, you know, they're different, right? It's the Hardy Boys mystery and a thousand places to go before you die and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven different books. So whatever we pick to put on our shelf first, here's our shelf we're going to pick our first book. We've got seven choices. Then we're going to have six books to choose from. All the way down. It's the same problem as the race. So how do we do it? It's seven factorial. Seven factorial different ways to arrange our books. 5,040. 5,040 different ways. That answer came up in one of our previous problems, didn't it? Was that... Maybe that was a different video, sorry. <laughs> I get a little too many videos. Okay. Um, so just keep in mind that with these arrangements, the order that we're arranging these matters. So one possibility would be to arrange the books just like this in alphabetical order. That would be one of these 5,040 possibilities. If I switch C and B and keep everything else the same, 
that's a completely different arrangement. So that counts as one of these 5,040 arrangements. And I could sit here and just start listing arrangements, and there would be 5,040 different ways. This is a one way, this is two ways. If I want to find a third way, I could um, you know, keep these, keep this order the same and switch the E and the D. This is very random. If I was actually going to list out the 5,040 ways, I would probably use a tree diagram. First choice, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Second choice, you know, then I could choose B or C or D, and that would list out all the 5,040. I wouldn't do that. I like math, but I wouldn't do that. All right, last example is going to throw some probability in here, which is good. A baseball team has nine players in the batting lineup. How many different batting orders are possible? Use a factorial and evaluate with your calculator. So again, it's the same kind of deal as our race back here. We're just, we, instead of these people in a race, we're going to put them in a batting order. So instead of first place, maybe this is batting first. And instead of second place in the race, this is batting second in the lineup. It's the same problem, right? So we have nine players to choose from to bat first. And then we'll have eight players to choose from to bat second in the lineup all the way down. So dot, dot, dot times two times one is nine factorial. All right, so nine factorial is a lot. Uh, 362,880. 362,880 possible batting lineups. So part B says, assume Chris bats first. How many batting orders are possible? So Chris is one of these nine players. All right, so here's our batting lineup. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth. Well, if Chris is going to bat first, that means there's one possibility for who's going to bat first if I really, really want Chris to bat first, okay? Now, I'm going to choose who's going to bat second. How many choices do I have left for batting second? That's right, I have eight. Eight people left on the team to choose from. And then I have seven, six, five, all the way down. Okay? So this is going to be basically one times eight factorial, which is just eight factorial. 40,320. I think we did that one earlier. All right, let's put a probability question in here. If a batting order is chosen at random, what's the probability that Chris will bat first? Chris bats first. So of all, all the people, we're just going to have a random drawing. We've got all our nine people, and we're just going to draw out names. Well, we know that there are 362,880 possibilities. And of those 362,880 possibilities, 40,000 of them will have Chris batting first. So if you listed all of these possibilities, 40,000 of them would have Chris batting first. So the number of ways that Chris could bat first, the number of batting lineups that has Chris batting first is 40,000 ways out of 362,880. So the probability that if we just choose at random, Chris is going to bat first, we can find that by doing 40,320 divided by 362880. It's kind of like a percent, right? How many of the batting, what percent of the batting orders has Chris batting first? And we get ones repeating, which is one ninth. One repeating is one ninth. Or you could say approximately 11% of all those ones. Now let me show you something kind of interesting here, another way to look at this where you could get this one ninth. Remember, the way that we got the number of ways that Chris could bat first was 1 times 8 factorial. So we did 1 times 8 factorial. And the total number of ways to do our lineup was 9 factorial. So if you think about what this means, oops, not 2. 
Trust me, this is going to be worth it here. This is kind of cool. Stick with me. We're almost done. 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 divided by... Can you see what would happen if you tried to reduce this fraction? Without multiplying it all out, you know, cancel some common factors here. Can you see it? Right? This ones are going to... Well, those don't do anything anyway, but those twos would cancel out to make 1. 4 divided by 4 is 1. 5 divided by 5. 6 divided by 7. What do we have left? Well, we've got 1 on the top and 9 on the bottom, right? 1 ninth. So when you're dealing with factorials in a fraction, there's a lot of cool canceling that you can do to make your life a lot easier. All right, well, I hope these examples of the fundamental counting principle along with some probability have helped you understand it better.